Okay, today's stuff we're going to be learning is Yevamo Daf Mem Hey. Today's stuff is dedicated by Deborah Hoffman Wade in grateful appreciation for my 90 year old mother, Geraldine Hoffman, who gave birth to me 69 years ago today. She continues to be a blessing. Mazal Tov. Okay, we're going to get started with um, a very interesting Daf, very relevant. We're going to talk about first the main issue is going to be a child born from a relationship between a Gentile or an Evid Knani, a Canaanite slave, and a Jew, a Jewish woman. The child is Jewish because the mother's Jewish. The question is, is the child considered a mamzer? Number one. If it's not a mamzer, is that child permitted to marry a Kohen or not? Okay, so the main sugar is going to really revolve around is it a mamzer or not? It's going to be a lot less discussion and it's going to be left very unclear. Can that child marry a Kohen or not? Okay, which is very, very relevant nowadays. Happens very often. Um, I believe we talked about this before as well. So he's going to end with an issue about conversion. And because we're not learning the next two Dapim live, and I don't know how many people are going to listen over Chag, or you're going to learn it on your own over Chag and Shabbat. But the next, the end of today's Daf and the next two Dapim all talk about a lot of issues related to conversion. Fascinating issues. And what's required at conversion? Do you need witnesses? Do you need a baiting to be in the room? Do you need, can women serve as a baiting? Also, it doesn't really talk about in the Gemara, can women serve as a baiting? But there's a very interesting article by Michal Tukhachinsky, which I only have in English right, uh, in Hebrew right now. I'm not sure, I think it might have been translated into English, but I haven't gotten my hands on it. But it appears in Hebrew on our site about whether women can function as a baiting to view a conversion. Okay, normally when a convert goes to the mikvah, so there's three dayanim that are there. There's all sorts of ways they do it with the women, with women. But there's a big question nowadays, can we find room for women? There's also two articles published by, um, in two different places that I also, on, on Daf Mem Zion, I'm just letting you know in advance in case you don't go on the site for that page. On Daf Mem Zion, I put links to three articles. Okay, number one, um, the article by Michal Tkachitsky, which is in Hebrew, but two other articles in English that basically take apart the sugyot and talk about the possible contradictions between the sugyot that appear at the end of today's daf, tomorrow's daf, and the daf after, which are all these fascinating sugyot about converts and what's required at the conversion, etc. So recommended reading for sure if you want to print them out before Shabbat, uh, before Chag. So they're definitely, they're all the links are there on page 47. So with that, we're going to get started. Ama Rabba Barbachana, we're starting at the bottom of Memdalad Amubet. Ama Rabba Barbachana, Ama Rabbi Yochanan, Hako, right? I, I feel like if, you know, we thought these issues of Chalitza and two wives, you know, Chalitza is relevant today, but two wives for sure is not really relevant today and all the Erva stuff. But these sugyot are, are super, super relevant and, uh, and, and go on nowadays, issues that the courts are dealing with a lot. So Ama Rabba Barbachana, Ama Rabbi Yochanan, Hako Modin. Everybody agrees, okay, which we're going to see in a minute. Not everybody agrees, but everybody agrees. If you have a relationship between a Gentile uh, or a slave, a Canaanite slave, and a Jewish woman, the offspring is a mamzer. Okay, he says everybody agrees. To which the Gemara says, Who is this everybody agrees that the child's a mamzer? So, Shimonatimni, the Gemara says, it must be, remember we saw yesterday, this machloket, Rabbi Akiva had said, mamzer is any chai ve'lavin. By the way, marrying a Gentile is a, is a lav. Lo titchatembam, you can't marry them. So that's a lo tase. Only Rabbi Akiva holds the vlad as a mamzer in a lo tase, right? A negative commandment. It was Rabbi Shimonatimni uh, said, the vlad's not a mamzer, right? It's only mamzer when it's chai ve'kritut. So now we're going to say, so what is Hakol Modim? Well, even Shimonatimni, Shimonatimni, even though generally he holds an Isra Lotase doesn't create a Mamzer. See this later. They're going to describe it a little better where they get this from, but right now we'll just take it as face value, which is there's two different kinds of Chayve Lavim. There's ones like the Chalitza. Remember we saw if you... If a man does chalitza to a woman, what happens? The the um, and then he decides to marry her. He's not allowed to do that because asher lo yivne. Remember, we said lo yivne means he can no longer be boneh. He can't decide to marry the woman later on. It's forbidden to him forever. Isor lav though. It's just a lo tase, a negative commandment. If he does that. Well, well, let's say he marries her anyway, right? We've discussed, right? Yesterday there was a whole big hullabaloo. How could an almana marry a kohen gadol? Well, people do things that are wrong. 
So if he goes ahead and marries her anyway, well, tafsibu kiddushin, the kiddushin will be valid. So those are cases where Shimon Atimni says, if it's chayve lavim and if you're to do it anyway, the kiddushin is valid, you'll, you'll actually be considered halachically married, even though you shouldn't have. That's when we're going to say the Vlad is not a mamzer. But, this is an exception to the rule. Why is it an exception to the rule? There's no kiddushin. If a Gentile man comes over and betrothes a Jewish woman, does a halachic kiddushin, it's invalid entirely. There's no such thing as kiddushin with a non-Jew. So therefore, since since there's no valid marriage, that means, by the way, right, that she's not an Eshati, she's not considered married to anyone, okay? If they if she, they want to get divorced, they don't need a get, they don't do a get, okay? All that. So, since that's the case, it's like, it's like, and therefore, Shimon Atimni will say, right, all other cases of and that's why we're going to draw the Vlad not a mom's here, because it's a valid marriage. Here, since the marriage is invalid, we're going to say, it's basically going to be put in the category of of Chayve Kritut, and we're going to say the Vlad is a mom's. Okay, so right now we started with, we're going to reject this in a minute, but we started with Rabbi Rabbi Khan in the name of Rabbi Yochanan saying the Vlad is a mom's there. Everyone agrees. Who's everyone? Even Shimon Atimni will agree. Metive, but now we're going to have a contradiction to this. Can't be Shimon Atimni agrees to this. Why not? It says in another Tanaitic source, Oveg Kochavin Ve'evet Habal Ba Yisrael, exactly our case. Havlad Mamzeel. Okay, so far that's Tanakama. Rabbi Shimon ben Yehuda Omeel. Now this isn't Shimon Atimni. This is a different Rabbi Shimon ben Yehuda. Ein mamzer elam imishi isuro isur evav anush karet. In order for it to be a mamzer, it has to have number one, right? Isur erva. That is anush karet. It is punishable by karet, which means it has nothing to do with kiddushin tofsin. It has to do with what the prohibition is. Is it an isur lav or is it an isur karet? Now, what does this have to do with Shimon Atimni? What it shows here, first of all, is that Tanakhama disagrees with Rabbi Shimon ben Yudah. Rabbi Shimon ben Yudah would say, this definitely falls into the category of not a mamzer, because it's not anush karet. You don't get karet for it. And since, now, who, does, who else says chayve kritut is mamzer? That's the criteria. That's Shimon Atimni. So Rabbi Shimon ben Yehuda must be going in the way of Shimon Atimni. So therefore, it can't be that Shimon Atimni would say, that the Vlad is a mamzer. Okay, so they're basically connecting these two opinions because they're saying he obviously, right, the Tanakhama held like Rabbi Akiva. This opinion seems to go against it and go with Shimon Atimni's general position, which is until now the only thing we've seen about Shimon Atimni is Chiyuv Karit. We didn't see this Kiddushin Tovs and we suggested it, but this seems to indicate definitely not. So therefore, Ela Amar of Yosef, Man HaKol Modim, who is this? Everybody agrees. Rebbe, it's Rabbi Yehuda HaNasi. Okay, now, how do we know this? Well, first we're going to see the Rabbi Yudanasi sides against Rabbi Akiva, which is going to say, but Dafka on this issue with the Gentile and the Eved and the slave, we're going to say that he agrees with him. Okay? And that's going to fit perfectly with this Hakol Modin. Everyone agrees though, right? Even though they disagree about most things, they agree about something. And now we're going to see it's Rabbi Yudanasi. So now, where do we see he holds against Rabbi Akiva? In the da, in Daf Nun talks about a different case. Okay, here he says it explicitly. I'm not going to get into the details. But we're going to see this all on Daf Nun. Okay, we're going to see it in a few days. It's not worth going into it right now. Also, time wise, Erev Chag. So we'll just kind of gloss over this quickly. But the point is, you'll see it in a few days. But the point is, he says. Even though, right, he says, all these things we're discussing are all according to Rabbi Akiva, we don't hold that way. So there it's clear, he doesn't hold by Rabbi Akiva, and they're talking here about the Chayve Lavim issue, right? And the Vlad's not going to be a mom's here. So even though he says that, okay, that's one thing Rabbi says, which now proves that if that's what he says, right, he obviously doesn't agree with Rabbi Akiva in general, but, but, be'oveg kochavim ve'eved modeh. But he does agree when it comes to Elvde Kochavim and an Eved, he agrees that the Vlad is a monster. Now, how do we know this? That's, again, you have to prove two things. Number one, he doesn't hold a Rabbi Akiva in general, but he does on this issue. And then that would fit into the sentence, which is all we're trying to do right now. When Rabbi Yochanan said, Hakol Modim, all agree, it would have to be someone who disagrees with Rabbi Akiva in general, but agrees with him about this. How does he know he agrees? 
תחיית הרב דימי, אמר רב יצחק בר רב דימי, משום רבנו, רבנו is רבי יהודה הנשיא. So now, let's get this straight. רב דימי, he's one of the people called the נחותי. They're the people who would go down from Eretz Israel to Babel. They would travel from Israel to Babylonia and bring the Torah of Israel. Remember, Rabbi Yudan Nasi lived in Israel. So they would bring it to the people in Babylonia. So he comes, now it's very important to know this, because soon we're going to see Ravin brings a different tradition. He's another Nechuti. In the same time period, he brings a different tradition of Rebbe. But right now we're going with this tradition of Rebbe. He says in the name of Rabbi Yitzhak Ravdini, who says in the name of Rebbe, again, who's Rabbi Yudan Nasi. He's the one who the Mishnah is attributed to, that he put it together. Perfect. That's what we were looking for. Who's this Hakomodim? It's Rebbe, who we already proved doesn't agree with Rabbi Yekiv in general, but does agree on this issue, and that would fit in perfectly with Rabbi Yochanan. So now we're going to say Hakomodim is Rabbi Yehuda Nasi. So that works perfectly with Rabbi Dimi's reading. Later we're going to see that Ravin has a different tradition about Rebbe, and therefore, right, has, has a different issue. And yes, we're talking here about a non Jew as a male. That's clear. Okay, we're talking about a non-Jewish male with a Jewish female, because if it's not a Jewish female, it's not a Jewish child at all. Okay, then forget about moms there, right? It's not Jewish. Okay, that's different. Rabbi Acha Sar Habira, Rabbi Tancho Bere, Rabbi Chia Ish Paraka. We're going to see today a lot of real life cases, because obviously this did happen. So, these two people from, right, one of them from Akko, Pluk Hanush Fuyata Da'atu Be'armon Tveria. They redeemed a bunch of kept captives, okay? A bunch of them were female captives that came from Armon to Tveria. You can look in the Koran if you have it. There's a whole debate about what these places were. There's different Girsaot because Armon could be Armenia, but that's nowhere near Tveria. Some people say it's Antiochia. There's a different version. Okay, where these places are, where they redeemed them from where to where is a whole question. Not really important for our purposes, but interesting in and of itself. In any case, they redeemed these captives. Now, what's the problem? The problem is that often when women were taken into captivity, they were raped by different men there. So now, there was one woman there that was pregnant with a non-Jewish, from a non-Jewish father. So they came before Rabbi Ami to figure out what's the status of this child. He says to them, look, he starts listing Rabbi Yochanan, who we saw already, the Rabbi Elazal, the Rabbi Hanina. So I've got three on my list. The Amre, he basically lists these three big rabbis that all say the child's a mamzer. So he wants to rule that the child's a mamzer. Amar of Yosef, what, you think you're going to pass in that way because you have a long list of rabbis? You say, oh, three rabbis, that's already a lot. And he, you know, that's my proof. So what's interesting about Rav Yosef is he's not going to disagree with his psak. He's going to disagree with the way he arrived at it. He said, you're giving me a list of three? I'll give you a list of four. And not only ones who lived in Israel, but I'll give you ones who lived in Babylonia and ones who lived in Israel, two there, two there. And I'm going to show you that if you're going to play the numbers game, I can play the numbers game better and come to the opposite conclusion. And now we're finally starting to see the other side. Okay, until now, we really only saw that the Vlad's a mom's there. So now we're going to see, right? I mean, we did see the Rabbi Shimon Atimni probably thinks that the Vlad is not a mom's there, but we didn't really discuss that so much. Now we're going to see a list of rabbis who held that way. Ha Rabu Shmuel Babel. Wow, they're of the great ones, right? The biggest Babylonian scholars were of the biggest. So they both held. And Rabbi Yosho ben Levi Yobar Kapara Be'eretz Israel. Okay, and two very big scholars on in Israel. Ve'amre le chilufe bar kapara ve'ayle ziknei darom. Some people say, take bar kapara out. What he really said was, Rabbi Yosho ben Levi and all this kinim in the south. Okay, all the elders, which makes it even more than four. Because uh, a group of people. De'amre, that they all say. They all say the Vlad is totally kasher. Now, again, we talked before about kasher. Does kasher mean kasher entirely can marry anybody? Or does kasher mean they're not a mom's there, but maybe they can't marry a Kohen? We're going to have to get into that, but right now that's not clear. The point is they say child's not a mom's there. So he basically says if you're going to play the numbers game, I can play the numbers game better than you and come to the opposite conclusion. So El Amar of Yosef, but Rav Yosef said, but I'll tell you why you should paskin that the Vlad is a mom's there. Because Rebbe he. Because it's Rebbe's opinion. And Rebbe, right, it's not quantity, it's quality. Rebbe is above and beyond all of the rest. And therefore, since Rebbe says it, how do we know Rebbe said it? Well, he's going to quote exactly what we quoted before. Tchiata Rav Dimi, Amar Rav Yitzchak Rav Dumi, Mishum Rabbeinu Amru, in the name of, of Rav Yudan Asi, they say, said, Ove kochabim be'evet abal ba'israel havlad mamzer. Okay, so he basically says, 
For that reason, you can hold, but not because Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Hanina, Rabbi Elazar, I could bring you a stronger list on the other side. Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi Omeo, now we're going to talk about, for a little bit, what about the status of the child regarding a Kohen. So he says, Havlad Mikul Kal. Okay, there's mom's there, kasher, and in the middle, there's Mikul Kal. Messed up, literally, okay, or however you would call it. So, Liman, for what is it Mikul Kal? So, Ilema Lekahal, if you're going to say Mikul Kal means he can't marry anyone in the regular community because he's treated like a mom's there. Hamar Rabbi Yeshua, Vlad Kasher. Rabbi Yeshua already said, right, that the Vlad is Kasher. So, Ela, and there's Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi. He himself was on that list of people who said the Vlad's not a mom's there. So, it can't be that. Ela Lekihuna. It must be Lekihuna. They now say that not only Rabbi Shob and Levi, but it seems all the Amoraim who agree that the Vlad is kasher, not a mamzer, all agree, though, that the Vlad can't marry a Kohen. Okay? Now, why? They're going to learn it from a Kavachomer, from, from the widow, which we learned yesterday already. Right? It's not forbidden to, it's not forbidden to anyone else to marry this Kohen Gadol, just... Right, it, it's not, she's not forbidden to marry everybody. It's just a specifically a Kohen Gadol. And yet, Bina Pagum, right? It's a very limited Isul prohibition. And yet, her child becomes disqualified to marry a Kohen. Now, Bina Pagum means two things. For women, it means they can't marry a Kohen. And, okay, well, we'll talk about for men, and then we'll see that that applies to women as well. For men, offspring, it means that they can't eat truma ever, okay? The female also can't eat truma, okay? She's disqualified from kihuna in general. That means normally if a woman's husband dies, let's say she's a bat kohen, she can eat truma, but then if the husband divorces her, she goes, I'm sorry, if she's a bat kohen, she eats truma, then she gets married, she goes to her husband's house, assuming he's not a kohen, she can't eat truma anymore, but if he dies, she goes back to her original home and she can eat truma again, okay? There's certain more criteria, but I'm not going to get into all that, but the main point is if this offspring is not allowed, okay? Okay, the woman, we're actually talking about the woman herself, can't go back and eat truma. And likewise, her children can't ever eat truma. And, okay, they're basically disqualified from that whole thing. So now, if we're going to say this, pagum, and yet, and it's only something that's a very limited prohibition, so Zoshi, Surash, call this one, right? That nobody is allowed to marry a Gentile, and she can't marry any Gentile, right? Basically, all are off, right? It's not just a Kohen Gadol, but it's everybody. Ain't Odin Shabbat Pagum, right? Does it not make her son disqualified? So, now they say, wait a minute, we rejected this yesterday. Remember, Mala Mana the Kohen Gadol? She came, he had She herself becomes disqualified, which is not the case for this woman, okay? Who doesn't become disqualified to a Kohen, although we'll see in a second she does, but right now they're going to suggest maybe she doesn't. Comes the Gemara and says, Hachanami. No, this woman also. A woman who sleeps with a Gentile is forbidden to a Kohen. Okay, okay if a Gentile or a slave sleeps with a Bat Kohen, a Bat Levi, or a Bat Yisraelit, he disqualifies her for the Kohuna. Where do we learn it from? Now, here the Pesach is talking about eating truma. Okay, we're going to see, though, if she can't eat truma, obviously she can't marry a Kohen. So, in other words, it's just because marrying a Kohen is even more severe, so obviously that's the case. This is a Pasuk that discusses, it's in Bayikra Kafbet, Pasuk Yud Gimel, it discusses when she goes back to eat truma in her father's home. It says, if she's a Bat Kohen and she becomes divorced or widowed, comes the, and then she can go back and eat truma in her father's home. So now they learn from here, it means she's widowed or divorced from a valid marriage, right? You can't be widowed and divorced if you were never considered married. Now, remember what we discussed earlier today. If you marry a Gentile, it's not considered a wedding and it's not considered a marriage. So, therefore, right? So she can't ever go back to eating truma if she was with someone who wasn't, she was widowed or divorced from someone that was never considered widowed or divorced from. Now, obviously, you could say she was never married to him, in which case she could still eat truma in her father's house. But the point is, no, it disqualifies you. This is a drasha, okay? It's not the pshat of the pasuk. It's a drasha to teach you she can no longer eat truma anymore. She's disqualified, okay? Because she did something 
inappropriate, dis despicable, that ruined her bat Cohen status. Okay, so now this was all to prove that whoever says, right, this was this call from an Almana, to say, even if you say kasher, it's disqualified for kuna. Now we're going back, Abai is going all the way back to Rav Yosef. Remember what Rav Yosef said? That Rebbe is the one who, when Rabbi Yochanan said, Akol Modim, that the Vlaz Mamzer, there, it's Rabbi Yudan Asi, and it's based on this Masoret, this tradition that Rabbi Dimi brought about Rebbe. Comes Abaye and disagrees, Amar Le Abaye, my chazit to Samachad Rav Dimi, Samachad Why are you relying on Rav Dimi's Masoret? You, his tradition, you should rely on Ravin's tradition of Rebbe, who holds the opposite. Tchiata Ravin, Amar Rabbi Amar, sorry, when Ravin came, he said the following. Rabbi Natan and Rabbi Yudan Nasi Morim Balehetera. He said, Rabbi Yudan Nasi and Rabbi Natan both agree that it's leheter. We permit the Vlad. It's not forbidden. Okay? So this is the opposite. Uman Rabbi Yudan Nasi, in case you weren't sure, Rebbe. Okay, we know this. Rebbe is always Rabbi Yudan Nasi. It's interesting here, the Gemara tells you, right? But we know this in general. So Rabbi Yudan Nasi is Rebbe. So now we have this debate. Okay, number one, debate what did Rebbe himself hold? And we have this debate, Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi and Bar Kapara, who all permit, and maybe all the Zikneit Darom, versus we have Rabbi Yochanan, Rabbi Hanina, Rabbi Elazar, who forbid, and possibly Rebbe. Okay, and say the Vlad is a mom's here. Okay, we actually don't paskin that the Vlad is a mom's here. We're going to see that at the end of the sugya. So if you're asking in terms of finding room to, to permit, in the end we do permit, okay? Um, we do say that the Vlad is not a mom's here. For us, I know you, you know, people like to know practically, so I know sometimes we won't wait till the end to see, but that is in fact how we hold. Even though it kind of comes out pretty strong on the side of Avlad Mamzer in the sugya, as you can see. But now we're going to start shifting the, the we're going to start tilting the balance, and we're going to start to see all these cases where they were mat here. We have a very interesting, um, with not a happy ending story with Rav. Af Rav More Bahetera. Rav also permitted, Vlad is not a Mamzer. How do we know this? Because there was a guy who was born from a union like this. So he wanted to know his status. He goes to Rav and he says, can I get married? Right? Or can I only marry a mamzeret or someone like me? He said to him, no. Oh, sorry, that was the question he asked Rav. He said, it's totally fine. So the guy says to him, Amarlei, Havli Baratach. Okay, so I want to marry your daughter. Okay, now imagine Rav's surprise, right? Here he comes to answer a halachic shaila for someone. And the guy puts him on the spot and said, oh, well, if you think I'm okay, then I want to marry your daughter. Okay, you have to like get in the mindset of the shidduch world in those days, right? And 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 what it meant. I mean, you have to think about Rav, this big Talmud Chacham. His son's going to marry, and you might say it's okay, but he's going to marry, sorry, his daughter off to the the, you know, a guy who's born from, you know, problematic lineage. I mean, yes, it's true that we treat him as a Jew and he can marry anyone, but you can see why Rav might not necessarily want to. The thing is, in this story, we never really see what Rav's motivation is. It's, you know, it's very likely he just, the guy wasn't a Tamil Chacham. Uh, you know, you can think of a million reasons why Rav, Rav went to marry, you know, there's all sorts of reasons why we choose if we're in the Shidduch business, right? Why we would choose to betroth our daughter to someone particular or not. So, again, you have to put yourself into that mindset. Obviously, no one's asking the woman what she wants because that's not, um, you know, that wasn't done in those days. It wasn't done, you know, in many cultures in those days in general. Anyway, he says, okay, I want to marry your daughter. Lo yehiv nalach. Rav says, no can do, okay? He would not give his daughter to be married to this guy. Amr shimi barchia le Rav. Rav's going to get criticized now. Shimi barchia comes over to him and says, Amr inashe, people are going to say, great line, Gamla bimadai akabarakta. A camel in meads, okay, or however you meads, media, um, <coughs> a camel in meads dances in a kav. Okay, what's a kav, right? Some people call it media, okay, um, dances in a kav. Now, what does this mean? Nobody really knows. It could just mean that, um, <coughs> it, oh, thank you for pointing that out. I forgot that. That Shimi was his grandson, right? Chia, Shimi bar Chia, no, he was his grandson. He, oh, Chia was the son of Rav. Interesting. Okay, I didn't catch that. Um, so now, what happens here? He says, 
people are going to say the camel and Medes dances in a cuff. Now, what does this mean? Some people just need, it doesn't mean dance. It means stands in an area that's used for a cuff of wheat, which is a very small area. In other words, some ridiculous thing, by the way, in the Quran, they say that the Steinsaltz, that the, the, using this, this Madai as their example was a way of saying some faraway place that no one ever went to. You know, people always say stories about, oh, in that place, you know, they do this and that. Okay. And they say some ridiculous thing that everybody, you know, maybe believes, but then what happens? Hakaba, Hagamla, Vahamadai, Velorakda. But here we are. It's in front of us. And we see the camel. We see where we're in Madai. We, we see the, the Kav and no dancing going on here. Okay. And he basically says, I see someone wrote in the chat in the beginning, which is right. Difference between theory and practice. It says, you're saying one thing, but you're doing something else. And people are going to say, you know, we don't trust you anymore. How can we take your psaac if you yourself won't act upon it? So Amarle, this guy could be the biggest, amazing person like Yoshua bin Nun, and I still wouldn't marry my daughter to this guy. Now, what he means here, we don't really know. Does this mean because of his lineage? Does this mean even if he had good lineage, right? I have other reasons for not wanting this guy to marry my daughter, okay? Forget about, you know, maybe my daughter doesn't like him. Maybe he's ugly. Maybe, I, who knows, right? He, he's not learned, right? Whatever it is, he's saying, you could be as great as you are, I still, right, he's not trying to tame me, he's trying to shimmy rachia, but he says, I still wouldn't do it, okay? There's no way I would marry this guy off to my daughter. Again, it seems to be saying, I have other issues. This isn't my issue, right? It's not because he comes from this bad lineage. I have other reasons with this guy. So, right, he says, uh, he says to him back, Amar leish, shimmy rachia persists. He says, listen, you're really in a bind because, right, you, it, what happened? This guy really put him in a bad predicament. And maybe that's why we're going to see the end of the story. The guy was unfairly, right? He put himself forward as saying, I want to marry her. And that put Rav in a very bad position because this is what Shimi Barchia says to him. Look, if the guy really was like Yoshua bin Nun, then you would be right. In other words, if you don't marry you're the guy off to your daughter, someone else will take him up. He's like Yoshua bin Nun. But hi, but this guy... If people see that you rejected him for shidduch purposes, you're going to mess him up forever, right? This is, think about all those, you know, Jane Austen movies and uh, books and, you know, all the all the issues that go on with shidduchim, you know, in, the, in that world. You have the same thing going on here, right? If someone rejects the person, oh, that's going to reject them for all sorts of, you know, other people as well. And basically, you're going to mess up this guy. So now this guy... First of all, the guy put Rav in an unfair position. On the other hand, he also got himself stuck because now he has no one to marry if Rav rejects him because they're going to say, oh, Rav wouldn't marry this guy because of his bad lineage. We're not going to marry him either. Off to our daughters. Lo hava ka'azlomi kamein. The guy wouldn't leave Rav. Okay? He basically said, you know, I'm insisting. Okay? He was very persistent. So how does the story end? Like every good Talmudic story. Yav be'ene ushchiv. Rav looked at him, right? Gave him the eye, okay? Which doesn't always mean he looked at him. Okay, but this is the rabbinic eye that if you do something wrong, right? Sometimes the rabbis look at you in a particular way and he died, okay? Again, what he was to blame for, maybe for putting Rav in this difficult position, maybe also closed off his own options, right? He didn't think about, like if you think about a chess game and you have to plan what's going to happen if this, what's going to happen if that, right? He didn't think it through well enough to figure out where this is going to lead me. And he put Rav in an uncomfortable position. And in the end, it caused his death. Okay, right. Whether, again, the truth of the story, whether he really killed him or not, we don't really know. Did the story really happen? Did it happen in this way? Did it, right? Did it end in this way? Right? But this is the way Talmudic stories go. Okay. Why Yav Be'ene? There's good footnotes in all the, you know, in the Koran and the Shatenstein about why Yav Be'ene, like what that means, how a, a Talmud Chachim could kill someone in that way. I'm not going to go into that because we have, you know, first of all, it's all conjecture. And anyway, we don't have enough time, but you can read up on it if you want. But Okay, not only Rav permitted this again, even though he himself wasn't acting on it, and Rav Mana also permitted this. So now, like I said, we're siding all on the side of, yes, it's okay. <coughs> How do we know Rav Yehuda? See someone asked in the chat before, why didn't they just tell him go somewhere else where nobody knows him? So first of all, they could have told him that. It's just he was unwilling to accept that. He was persistent in wearing rough. But that's exactly what they're going to suggest right now. When they came before Rav Yehuda, 
someone came before him. Amar le zil itamer onase batminech. Go hide, meaning go to some other place where nobody knows you, and they won't know about your lineage and don't tell them. Like hide your, like Esther, Lohigida, Maladita, right? She didn't say where she was from. Go, don't tell anybody what your lineage is. Go get married, you know, then you can tell them, right? This is fascinating. It raises a whole question, a moral question. Is it okay to lie or to withhold information in, a, in order to have a shidduch, right? It's a big ethical question. The, the achronim jump on this and say, how could this be? And what's this, you know, and they try to come up with, well, no one really divorced them on these grounds if they were actually married. So it's okay. It's not like something, right? It would just kind of prevent them from thinking they should marry you. But in the end, if they were married to you and loved you, they wouldn't really divorce you on this. So therefore it would be okay. All sorts of kind of excuses to try to explain how could we possibly accept this on ethical grounds that someone could actually lie. Um, but you see, he's really trying to help these people because they were stuck. Nobody wanted to marry them, right? Especially right, nowadays, people fall in love and, and, you know, there's a chance for someone like that. In those days, there was no chance for people like this. They were tainted. Or nasi batmine, or marry someone like you, Okay, find another woman that's, you know, born from a union like this. And, you know, that would also be an option. Same thing in front of Rava. Rava. So, by the way, this shows, if he told him, go lie about it, it shows there's no problem with it, right? If he was a mom's here, he wouldn't tell him, go lie about it and don't tell anyone you're a mom's here. So, Rava, either exile, again, go to a place nobody knows you, or or marry someone like you. So now they ask, the people of B'nai Mirza ask Rabbi the following question. Now we're going to jump to a new topic. Similar, but connected, but something else. Okay, the Gemara, one of their favorite cases. It's a fascinating situation. Someone has two masters and one frees them and one doesn't. So remember, we're talking about Canaanite slaves. If they're not free, they're kind of pseudo-Jewish. They're part of the Jewish household, but they can only marry a slave woman. If they're freed, they can marry only Jewish women because they're Jews. So now we have someone who's half half, one one owner freed him, the other one didn't. There's a whole famous Machok about Chama Hill, if you remember. And they say in the end, right, you have to force the other one to free him because it's not fair to leave him in this in between situation. But let's say he is in that in between situation and he has a child with a Jewish woman. Haba by Israel Mahu. What's the status of the child? So Amar Lahu Rabbi says to them, What what kind of a question is this? Hash to Eveg Kulo Amrinan Kasher Chetzium Bibaya. If a regular slave is going to be permitted, as we saw these rabbis permitted, that the child of that union is per- permitted. So now that we have a guy who's half Jewish and half slave, of course we're going to permit his child, right? He's in a better situation because he's half Jewish, at least, as opposed to the Evid, who is fully not Jewish. So I'm Rabbi Yosef. Rabbi says, what are you talking about? I have a contradiction in what you're saying. Moving out, I'm a bet. Mara Deshmata Manu, Rav Yehuda. Who's the one who permits it? That they're basically saying, you know, those who permit. Well, Rav Yehuda is among them, right? He was one of the people that we saw permitted this. So when you say they permitted a regular slave, and therefore they should definitely permit this half slave, well, Hama Rav Yehuda, if you're going to assume that goes by Rav, Rav Yehuda, who permits the child of a, of a union of an Eved, but Rav Yehuda himself said, Mishchatu Eved, the Chatu Ben Chor, in this case exactly, Haba Ba Yisrael, Otovlad, Ein Lo Takana. The child has no way to resolve his situation, his predicament, meaning basically, okay, now, commentaries actually disagree what exactly this means because it doesn't say the Vlad is a mom's there, but Rashi holds the Vlad is a mom's there, okay? Ein Lo Takana, meaning can't marry anyone other than a mom's there. So, if you're going to say it's so obvious that if an Eved, the child is not a mom's heir, right, according to Rav Yudah, let's say, and then a Chetzio Eved for sure would it be because he's already got a half Jewish side, well, Rav Yudah himself rules in this case that it's a problem. So, how can we explain this contradiction in Rav Yudah? So, the first, we're going to have one answer and then we're going to reject it and give a different answer. Ki itmar de Rav Yudah, ki gon de Kaddish ba Yisrael. This is a fascinating theoretical thing, or I, I don't know how you say it. But here, what we have is he's actually sleeping with an Eshet Ish. Why is he sleeping with an Eshet Ish? And that's what is, what's the reason it's a mom's here? Because it's an Evid Knani who's having a relationship with a married woman. Why is she married? Well, he says the case must be that he didn't just sleep with her, but he married her. So we took this half, right? He's half Jewish, half not Jewish. So the half Jewish side of him did a kiddushin with her. He married her. So she's married to the half that's Jewish. The other side of him 
is not married to her because a Gentile, right, a slave can't marry a Jewish woman. He's now sleeping with an Eshadish of someone who's married to his other half. It's a bit of a, it sounds like a split personality kind of thing. Okay, so exactly. So, so basically, it's a very odd thing. And in general, in any case, the Gemara is going to reject this. But it's an interesting theoretical thing that we can have him, his slave side, sleeping with his, you know, a married woman on the, who's married to his himself. Okay, very strange. So they reject this not because it's so strange, but they say it, there's actually no halachic basis to what you're saying. Because Ha'amri Nahardia and Nahardia, they say, Mishmedi Rabbi Yaakov, Lidivrei HaPosel, Posel Afilu B'Pnuya. Lidivrei HaMachshir, Machshir HaFilu B'Eshetish. This whole thing about an Eved, there's no laws of an Eved sleeping with a married woman. In other words, if an Eved sleeps with a woman who's Jewish, the Vlad, on some people say the Vlad's a Mamzer. Some people say the Vlad is not a Mamzer. But whoever says the Vlad is a Mamzer, does it matter if she was married to someone else or not married to someone else? That's the divrei ha posel posel afilu b'pnuya. They just they say the vlad the moms are whether she's married or not. Okay, that part's not important to us. We want to know the divrei machshil, the one who permits it and says the vlad's not a moms here. Afilu be'eshet ish, eat machshir afilu be'eshet ish. Says the vlad's not a moms here, even if she's a married woman. Normally, a man sleeps with a married woman. The vlad's a moms here. That was the whole answer here. The eved slept with. The w- woman who's married to his other side. But the one who permits, like Rav Yehuda and all the others, would per- permit, according to Naharda, they permit even married women. In other words, not that they permit it, they just say, it, the Vlad is not a mom's here. Because regarding the, the Eved, right, there's no such thing as a relationship with an Eshadish. It's, it's forbidden. It's a lotus. He can't marry any Jewish woman. He can't have a relationship with her. But that's, it doesn't matter if she's married or not married. So however you view this, if you're going to say the child's kasher, it's going to be kasher even if she's married. Ushnem, now, now we could have just stopped, but already we're getting to this, and I said we get to this later, which is shneem lo lam dua elamei eshetav. They're both darshan from the same place. They just darshan it in different ways. There's a pasuk in Dvarim Kafkim al Pasuk Aleph that talks about marrying your father's wife. Okay, let's say your father dies. You can't marry the woman he was married to. And the next pasuk says you can't marry a mom, Sarah. Okay, so now, right, can't be married into the community. From there, they learn that someone who marries their father's wife is a mom's there. The child is a mom's there. Okay, from the smichut, from the connection of the two psukim. So now, they're going to say, well, we're going to learn this all out from Eshet Av. Man de pasil, the one who disqualifies Saval. Ma Eshet Av de lo tafsibu kiddushin havlab mamzel. Av kol de lo tafsibu kiddushin havlab mamzel. This is where we get what we suggest at the top of the, da- the Amr Aleph, which is, it all depends if Kiddushin or Tovsim or not. In the case of when a man marries his father's wife, there's no Kiddushin there, right? If you were to marry her anyway, it wouldn't be a valid marriage. You wouldn't need to get, right? You wouldn't be considered married. She wouldn't be an Eshadish. So likewise, right? In this case, Lo Tafsibu Kiddushin, if an Evan marries a Jewish woman or a Gentile marries a Jewish woman, there's no Kiddushin. So therefore, the Vlad is mom's. This is just getting at, again, not this issue of, the one who was machshir, even Eshet, even Eshetish, that's not what they're talking about here. They're just talking about, is the Vlad a mom's here or is it not? Mant machshir, the one who says the Vlad is not a mom's here. This is really the reason for the whole in today's staff. Ma'i shetav de lidide lo tafsibu kiddushin, ta'achrine, la'achrine, tafsibu kiddushin. Eshetav is unique in the fact that if you, you're the son, marries your father's wife, there's no kiddushin. But if Joe Shmo marries your father's wife, there is valid kiddushin. That's what makes this unique. That for you, there's no kiddushin. For someone else, there is. That's going to be a case where the vlad is a mom's here. But la fuke obey kochavim ve eved de lo tafsibu kiddushin klal. But in eved and obey kochavim are different from that because they never have kiddushin. Nobody can marry them. No Jewish woman, and therefore, right? There's never kiddushin. Okay, that was just a reason. But now getting back to our question. So how do we resolve the question with Rav Yudaf? We can't say it was that he married her and the free side of him married her and therefore she was neishadish, since that's not a factor. What are we talking about? It's not that he betrothed her. <clears throat> it's that she was already a married woman. We're talking about a case where he slept with a married woman. Now, since he's half Jewish, the half Jewish side of him, the free side, actually slept with a married woman. And that's why the Vlad is mom's here. So you'd have to, this is again what we call an ukimte. It was a unique case, right? The first was an ukimte saying he betrothed her. 
Now we're saying she was betrothed to someone else. Now the Tzad of Duchibo, it doesn't matter. The Vlad wouldn't be a mom's there, but he does have a half, he's 50% free, which means he's 50% fully Jewish and he slept with a married woman. That's why the Vlad's a mom's there in this case. So when Rav Yehuda said that that Vlad is no Takana, he meant if she was married to somebody else. <coughs> and with that, we resolve Rav Yehuda. Amar Ravina. Now we're going to get into this issue of Nahardi. I said it seems clear. Whoever, apostles, apostle, right? Whoever says the Vlad's a mom's here, it doesn't matter if she was married or not. Whoever says the Vlad's not a mom's here, it doesn't matter if she was married or not. There's no Eshadish issue for a Gentile or for an Evan. But now we're going to see a different approach to this. Amar Ravina. Amar Li Rav Gaza. Ravina said that Rav Gaza told me the following story. Ikla, Rabbi Yossi bar Avin Laatrin. Oh, and by the way, I just want to make it clear here that that we started with this question, why is the Chetzu Evet Chetzu Ben Chorin? It can't be any, right? He's more Jewish. It can't be stricter and worse than Misha fully Evet, right? Because if a full Evet sleeps with a, a woman and has a child, the Vlad's not a mom's here. So how can we be more strict with the Chetzi? Now we see why we can be more strict with the Chetzi because he's half Jewish and here he slept with a married woman, which is worse for a Jew than it is for a Gentile. So in that way, right, that's how we really answered the question. So now Ravina says that Rav Gaza told me, Ikla Rabbi Yossi bar Avin la'atrin. He came to the following place, this Rabbi Yossi bar Avin. V'hava uvde b'pnuyan. There was a case with a, with a Gentile who was with a non-married woman. V'echshar. And they said the child's not a mom's there. Be'eshet ish upasil. There was a case where a Gentile married a Jewish woman who was married, who was slept with a Jewish woman who was married, and they disqualified him. Okay, they said the child is a mom's there. So that goes against but Rav Shesha comes along and says, I'm Rav Shesha, Ledidi Amrli Rav Gaza. You got it wrong. Rav Gaza told me something totally different. He told me, number one, Lo Rabbi Yossi Bar Avin Hava. You got the name wrong. It wasn't Rabbi Yossi Bar Avin. Ela Rabbi Yossi Bar Avin Zveda Hava. Okay, it was the wrong guy. Number two, There were two cases and he permitted them both. No mom's harem at all, and that fits with Naharda. And we're going to see another case. Amalei Rav Acha Bere Deraba Le Ravina. Ikla Amemar La Atra. And Amemar also came to our city. The Echsher Ben Bepnuya Ben Bebeshish. And he also permitted two cases with the Pnuya and an Eshadish. Basically, Naharda is right. There's no distinction. The Hilchita. Now, here comes the big line of our Sugya. Very relevant. Hilchita Ove Kochavim Ve'evet Habal Ba Israel Havlag Kasher Ben Bepnuya Ben Bebeshish. We now pass in Likula in all directions. Well, we'll see, maybe not. But this child born from a union of a Gentile or a, non, or a slave, right? The slave is not relevant anymore in our day. But the Gentile is very relevant. Someone who's not Jewish has a child with a Jewish woman. Child is number one Jewish and kasher. No. What does it mean, kasher? Okay. Does kasher mean they can marry a Kohen or not? Okay. Now that's the question. Because the Sugya dealt with it somewhat and said the ones who permitted said that you can, right, you can't marry a Kohen. But it's not so clear here. Kasher seems to be Kasher, right? When you want to say can't marry a Kohen, you usually say Pasul. If you want to say it's a mom's here, you say it's a mom's here. So it's very strange here. And because of that, there's a big machlokan among the commentaries. We actually, I believe we discussed this another time, which is that there's a big debate about this issue. And in Israel, they're more like, there's a psaq that says that Bidiyevid, we can accept it. The question is, what's Bidiyevid? Okay, how far do we go in saying it's already, right? So, Usually, but the other means, well, if they're already married, we'll leave it, okay? And, right, in other words, if the child's born already, we'll say the child's okay, but don't go ahead and get married, okay? In other words, uh, sorry, I'm getting confused now with the child. What we're talking about now is can the child marry a Jewish woman? Sorry. Can, if the child's a woman, can she marry a Kohen, right? The Truma issue is no longer relevant. Can she marry a Kohen? So this is a big issue. If she's already married, then we could say she could stay married. That's for sure, but the other but what if they're living together? What if they already have a strong relationship, right? Can we permit that? Again, we're talking about something very relevant. Women who were born from a Gentile father, okay? With a Jewish mother. So she's Jewish, but her father's Gentile. Can she marry a Kohen? So it's a big question nowadays, okay? How we rule on this issue. In Israel, they're generally a little bit more lenient on this and try to find room to say, well, if they already have a relationship or they're already living together, then we can rely on that and then... That can already be Bidiyevin, and then we can allow it. So there's a big, it's a very, very relevant issue. Okay, let's move on. Rava Echshuel of Mary Barachel. Rav Mary Barachel is famous. He was known that um, the mother was Jewish, Rachel, but she was a prisoner and was with this guy, Isur, this uh, non-Jew who ended up converting after I think she was pregnant already. 
So his father was not Jewish at the time. Umani Beporsa de Bavel. And Rav permitted him to even be, have, a, have a, an important position. Now, even though, Afagav de Amr Mar, Som Tasim Alech Amelech, okay, where you're only allowed to have a king, it says, Mikera Vachecha, from one of your brothers. You can't hire someone to positions of prominence unless they're one of your brothers. Well, because it's part of the Jewish people. So his, right, his mother was Jewish. He can be considered Mikera Vachecha. Now we end with these three cases about Tfila of Gerim, which is a very strange, so again, it seems to, either we just don't pass in this way or, or you have to understand it in some other ways other than the simple reading. But they, this sort of raises a lot of questions about Tfila for a Ger. We normally know you have to have a baked in of people there, seeing you do Kabbalat Mitzvot and all that. So Avdei de Rabbi Chia Barami, there was this Evid of Rabbi Chia Barami, Ad Balei Lahi Ovede Kochavim L'Shem Intita. He, he had this woman go in the mikvah so that he could be with her to get out of her nida status. Okay, she was menstruating. He had to go to the mikvah to become pure. Now, why this ever wanted this woman who wasn't Jewish to be pure is a very strange question, but it seems many of the commentaries say she was in the middle of a conversion process. She did a conversion and there just were no witnesses. So she was sort of Jewish, but she was considered Gentile because if there's no witnesses, you're not actually converted. So what happened here? See, Tovel her for Taran Mishpacha purposes. I'm Rav Yosef. I could make her kosher and her offspring. Ba kid Rav Asi. I'm Rav Asi. Milo tavla niduta. Rav Asi said, look, if she already tovel for nida, that can count for her conversion. Now, this is very strange. How could that possibly count for a conversion if there were no witnesses? Don't you need a bait in there? Don't you need Kabbalah mitzvot? Some people say, that's why they say she had already toveled. And this just proved that her original conversion was valid. Even What's the problem? Why do you need witnesses to make sure she accepted mitzvot? Well, if she's going to the mikvah for family purity reasons, she must have accepted mitzvot. And here's your proof that she accepted mitzvot. Some people say this is her Kabbalat mitzvot. There's all different ways of understanding this because it's very complicated and hard to figure out how halakhically this would work. Bibarta, what about her daughter? Well, once we call her Jewish, her daughter's obviously the child of Evevot, right? Ove kochavim beevet of Abba Yisrael of Lag Kasher. Right? This is what we've been talking about all day. So that works. Two more stories like this. Ahud avakari le'ar mayata. The people called this woman, this this man, sorry, the son of a woman who was Gentile. Amarav Asi, Milo Tavlala Niduta. Didn't she already go to the mikvah for Nida, which means, again, we can count that retroactively she must be a convert. Okay, she must have converted. Amarav Ahud Avakari Lebar Amarai. There was a guy who people called him the son of a non-Jewish guy. And Amarav Yishob and Levi, Milo Tavlala Kirio. Didn't he go, he had seminal emissions and didn't he go to the mikvah from that? So again, that could retroactively count toward his conversion. So again, a lot of questions raised on this. How could this possibly count for conversion? That's why I also recommended these articles for you to read because, but you might want to wait till you get through Daf Mem Zion and then read them and you'll see how they grapple with all these different sugyot. Either we just don't hold this way or we try to explain it in some other way that kind of seems there was some sort of conversion. This kind of solidified it or proved to us that the original conversion was valid. All sorts of possibilities about how to read these interesting sugyot. Okay, with that, I wish everyone a Chag Sameach and a Shabbat Shalom.